Dear Delegates, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all to the third edition of the world's largest fintech fest, Global Fintech Fest 2022, organized by National Payments Corporation of India, Payments Council of India, and Fintech Converges Council. This edition of FEST is supported by the Department of Economic Affairs, RBI, and IFSCA. The topic of our discussion is the future of FinTech Web 3.0 and also CBDC, which will be the part of the discussion. We are glad to have an esteemed speakers and panelists lined up for the same. So today, joining us virtually, we have Ms. Priyadarshini G, Associate Fellow, Current G India, Mr. Francis Souza, Director, Partnership, ACI Worldwide, Mr. Kamaljeet Rastogi, CEO, Manipal Business Solutions. We're very glad to have you all. In order to moderate this session, we would like to introduce you Mr. Ronit Ghosh, Head Fintech and Digital Asset Research, City. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Ronit Ghosh, who will take over from here. Great, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Amla, and a great welcome to my fellow panelists. We're going to be talking about the future of fintech, web 3.0, whatever that is, and CBDCs. Now, all of you are obviously familiar with fintech, otherwise you wouldn't be attending a fintech festival. Um, fintech is basically the iteration of financial services for the 21st century. Finance and money has existed since the dawn of civilization. You can trace bank notes, coins, bank receipts back thousands of years. The first bank note, if you like, was a thousand years old on the Great Silk Road. The first bank receipt, like a tablet, goes back 5,000 years to Mesopotamia. Now, with the growth of the internet, particularly the consumer internet, and specifically in countries like India, the mobile revolution and the cheap data revolution that we've all benefited from, we are seeing the next iteration of financial services being brought to us by banks, payment companies, tech companies, fintech, startups, all kinds of firms. And we're getting a kaleidoscope. It's a bit like when I was a child growing up, and I'm going to age myself now in the 1970s in India, we had one channel. Now, many of you are probably not old enough to remember that. And children's TV came on for like half an hour or something. In fact, the whole TV was on for about three or four hours. We had to tune into Bangladesh TV to have more than three hours TV in Kolkata back in the 70s. Anyway, just like TV change, you've got thousands and thousands of channels around the world, including in India, in multicolor, financial services and money has changed and will carry on changing. And to discuss this, I have some excellent panelists. And I'm going to ask Francis to kick us off by telling us from his perspective, how has fintech changed financial services already in what should we look forward to in a kind of a Web3 world? Thanks, Ronit. <clears throat> uh, so I'd like to actually look at this, you know, from a two-prong approach. One is from a common man approach and the other is from a central bank. Okay, so, so what's happening today from a fintech standpoint and what would happen, let's say, in a Web3 and a CBDC world, more from a CBDC perspective. So let's say for the common man, FinTech has increased the speed of financial inclusion very definitely. It's enabled several last mile use cases with apps that are seamless, inclusive through ease of use, and enabling citizens at the lowest rungs of the society to track low value transactions. FinTech applications have also helped the government by steering the public away from the informal economy. So that's a huge plus for the government too. Okay, and in terms of stimulating innovation and ambiguity on several and, and you can imagine when I say several, okay, there's a huge amount of use, you know, payment use cases that are yet to be explored. Okay, but all of this is leading into, you know, high job creation. And if you were to look at this from a number standpoint, okay, before 2016, 
real time payments was a huge load of volume of transactions that was never ever happening in india okay and and even across the world wherever real time payment networks exist so if we were to measure this in numbers okay and 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 beginning with december 2021 okay so upi supported 4.56 billion transactions in december 2021 in april it was 5.58 billion transactions and in august it was 6.57 billion transactions a clear jump of 1 billion transactions every 4 months of this year okay imagine that volume there okay and imagine the number of jobs it would be creating in the background the amount of money that's flowing in real time and making business even grow much faster okay and all of this count is just 92% of the upi transactions of 2021 okay we are still we are going to soon i mean soon close that gap of 8% and yet to go with another 4 months of the year now if we talk about central banks and cbdcs okay and for that matter you know with fintech and web3 coming together it would help drive better kyc and aml methods through account or token cbdcs uh, it would enable better payment governance uh, cbdcs are programmable with smart contracts they could be earmarked for targeted spending uh, basically so that would even help uh, reduce a lot of wrong spending a lot of incorrect spending or corrupt spending uh, basically uh cbdcs can enable quick and direct subsidy or helicopter money distribution for the poor on government schemes especially in the times of crisis like we seen the pandemic okay and by the way india did an excellent job even in the absence of cbdcs they were able to still reach out directly to you know those in need and then reducing bank cost of operations and service fees especially for cross border payments and being able to conduct low emitter transaction settled in real time across borders So yeah, there's a lot that fintech can still bring in, you know, together with Web3, CBDCs, and all the other type of digital payments that are yet to come uh, within India uh, and in the industry in total. Uh, so yeah, that that's how I look at it from a fintech uh, growth point of view. Thank, thank you, Francis. Um, Kamalji, the same question, please. How has fintech changed Indian financial services already, and how's it going to change going forward, particularly with Web3 and CBDCs? I think you're on mute. Oops, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Okay. So I'm representing Manipal Business Solutions. Uh, we are part of the Manipal Group. Uh, we are the fintech arm. Uh, one of the businesses that we do is financial inclusion. Uh, so I want to start by sharing a personal experience. Uh, we are doing a project in Uttar Pradesh where we are enrolling women self-help groups. to provide banking services in the villages where they are present uh, so a couple of months ago i went on a visit to two districts hathras and kanauj districts uh, kind of which are kind of on the way from delhi to lucknow and i met some of the shg groups right so about in one village about 15 women came to meet us and they were so confident about the banking services that they were providing in the village from account opening to cash deposit to withdrawal to loan applications they were talking of od and cash transactions like you would expect from any banker to uh, talk about uh, so that was a eye opener for me and uh, also they were all women groups in fact one of the ladies was a double ma so when i asked them that you know if you were not doing this kind of a role what would you have done they didn't have an answer so the fintech collaboration with the government and with the banks have made fintech services reach really the masses right and it is being enabled by women at the end right so financial services being provided by the house uh, the 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 uh, uh, housewives the women the village Uh, to the masses where, where the customers also feel very comfortable in uh, doing their transactions the second change that i have seen is in the doorstep banking uh, so with all the technology that we have now in terms of uh, the, the the you know the aadhar based transactions which can be done at home the kyc the biometric kyc uh, you know we are providing uh the doorstep e kyc services for multiple banks right so instead of the customer coming to the bank or to a physical location 
uh, our agents, we have about 5,000 such uh, doorstep delivery happening per day, going to the doorstep, doing the biometric KYC of the customer and issuing them a payment instrument. So these are the two changes that I've seen uh, how FinTech has changed the financial services uh, so far. Uh, thank you, Kamalji. Um, last but not least, uh, Priya, I'd love to bring you into the conversation. The same question, and maybe we could just focus in on a couple of the points that have been raised already. Um, Francis has talked about uh, a point we all know, I guess, is how successful real-time payments in India has been. In that context, why do we need more change? Like, I don't know if you have a view on CBDCs and stable coins and so on. Why do we need um, blockchain based or similar kind of t DLT based technology isn't isn't what we have already pretty good. Um, and the second question I had was tying into the example we just heard about uh, um, specifically about women in finance, but more broadly about inclusion. Is this a PR point? I I mean, has fintech is fintech really helping people? Can we just can you share some examples of your views on that of FinTech has helped and technology and digital has helped financial inclusion. Sure, sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much um, to NPCI, PCI and FCC for uh, inviting me to the fest. And it's my pleasure to be part of this esteemed panel. And uh, and uh, of course, you know, both my co-panelists have already spoken about the inroads made by FinTech in the delivery of financial services, stuff that has already occurred. <clears throat> um, well, um, I think I think the first thing to note is that uh, if you're talking about, uh, you know, Web3, CBDCs and digital assets, there is a conceptual difference between the two uh, or, or the three. Uh, central bank digital currencies are digital representations of fiat currency. So in some sense, they actually reinforce the centralized financial architecture that exists today. But if you look at Web3 and uh, digital assets like crypto assets, uh, they are based on decentralization, at least in theory, right? Um, and uh, the idea behind decentralization is to sort of um, uh, do away with the intermediaries, um, intermediaries like central banks, uh, payment service providers, other fintech entities to sort of bring in the efficiencies to reduce costs and connect transacting parties together. So in theory, at least, uh, there is a role uh, for technologies like blockchain and uh, digital assets on the basis of which applications like decentralized finance are uh, built. Um, Web3, well, um, it is supposed to be a th the third iteration of the internet, uh, which will democratize and put control uh, over data and activities and creativity in the hands of the users. But we are some time away from that. So I'll uh, just sort of maybe stick to CBDCs and digital assets at this point. Um, if you look at um, um, Earlier this year at the budget announcement, when the Honorable Finance Minister announced the rollout of a digital rupee, uh, one of the uh, one of the use cases or one of the um, rationales or motivations that she mentioned was a more efficient cash use, uh, cash management system. Today, as much as we've made a lot of inroads uh, when it comes to fintech and online digital payments, we are still a country where cash is king. And if you look at the stated goals of uh, the RBI and the government, it is eventually to move to a cashless uh, economy. Uh, so to that extent, I think, and, and another thing to sort of also remember is that uh, RBI has also stated uh, that given the diversity and the scale of population in India, um, uh, the, um, the objective would be to deliver as many options as possible to the population when it comes to payments. Um, so that's in terms of the goals uh, and the stated objectives. Uh, but again, going back to um, uh, con uh, conceptual level, today when you talk about online digital payments, whether it's the UPI or Google Pay or any of the other you know, plethora of payments that we have, at the end of the day, they rely on um, private money. That is money that is, uh, um, um, is uh, that's, uh, sort of put in the economy by private banks. And to the extent that it's private money that we're dealing with, we protect it in case of um, if there is a problem with, uh, the, say, the banks or the other financial intermediaries that we're dealing with. We are protected as consumers to the extent of uh, the insurance. Um, so today, if you look at uh, how much of our uh, uh, deposits are insured, it's up to five lakhs, right? But when you but 
central bank money is conceptually different. It is money that is issued by the central bank. It is the safest money that is around. It is also guaranteed by the government. So if you look at your one rupee note or 10 rupee note or 100 rupee note or 500 rupee note, you will see that it's signed by the governor. It's a promissory note where the central bank says that it will deliver the money that is uh, the face value of the uh, of the note. And it's also guaranteed by the government. So for force, it's the safest money that's available. So to that extent, I think um, CBDCs, which will essentially be a digital representation of this fiat currency, will also offer an option uh, and a safer option. And uh, if you are to go by what uh, you know, the deputy governor of RBI and uh, you know even the governor has said in the past, uh, perhaps a safer option for those who are um, who uh, who um, are used to cash at this point, and also those who may who may be uh, attracted by the proliferation of other digital currencies like cryptocurrencies that are not necessarily safe. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Um, and so far as the first question is concerned, and the second question, Ronit, if you don't mind repeating. Sure. The second question was about financial inclusion. Um, that Kamaljeet had given a really good live case study on, but maybe we can park that second question for now and come back to financial inclusion with the whole panel because Priya, I just want to, if it's okay with you, dive further into what you've been saying. Um, sure. And also, I think Francis touched upon this as well. Yes, CBDCs give me programmability, agreed. Um, I can direct, like, you know, social aid directly in all countries uh, to the recipient in a more maybe efficient way programmability gives some you know smartness and governance um yet at the same time priya you raise this really interesting question uh point uh, is digital is booming in india yet cash continues to grow in fact after that dip around demonetization we've seen and you look at the amount of now the whole economy is growing, so maybe that's part of it. But the amount of banknotes out there, the Indian public, and it's true around the world, it's the same in the UK, for whatever reason, for different reasons, even here in Dubai, where I'm based, people still have banknotes. Now, if the public wants to have the anonymity or the kind of maybe symbolic security of a physical item why should we be pushing the cbdc agenda we're all and i'm being a bit of a devil's advocate here because we're all this fintech conference we all i think in our lives like in my working life my job is to talk about digital and fintech and so we're all promoters of this but does the public want this are we giving them something they don't want um so what's the like what's the consumer use case here like i get the government or policy use case if I was a policy person, I understand why I would want CBDC. Does the consumer want it? Not just in India, in any country. Uh, I don't know who wants to. Priya, you wanted to answer that, or maybe yeah, can, Francis jump in. Sure, yeah, sure. I can give it a shot, and then of course. Uh, Does the common uh, woman want this? <laughs> no, I think the first point to note here is that uh, well, we don't really have a lot of live rollout rollouts of CBDCs as yeah. yet. I mean, we uh, really, we have two countries. One is the Bahamas and the other is uh, Nigeria um, mm. that have rolled out a CBDC. So we get to sort of see how this pans out in the real world. And um, so a lot of it is really in theory and research and experimentation. And um, and I, absolutely, you're absolutely right. I think uh, more so for maybe countries like India where we already have a very strong online digital payment system. Um, from the consumer point of view, at least, I think the question will be, what is the real value of introducing uh, CBDCs, right? And that's a question or that's a, that's a, um, I think, uh, uh, and especially in relation to um, the proliferation and use of cash in, in our system. I think that's a question that our policymakers will have to answer because at the end of the day, uh, at least to my mind, um, there are a lot of uh, choices that the policymakers will have to make in terms of what are the, uh, policy motivations, how are we going to deal with the trade-offs, uh, what are going to be the design choices, and, and more importantly, what is going to be the adoption uh, of this public good? Because unless it is adopted widely, or at least adopted to the extent that you're able to achieve your policy objectives, uh, does it really make sense, um, instead of expending the public exche uh, exchequer, or putting all that effort into something that may not uh, necessarily have any uptake? So that's a question that uh, I think uh, most central banks are definitely grappling with. And uh, given that there is, uh, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of central banks are researching that I think about 100 across the world now. Um, mm. 
-hmm. And uh, some have come together with international organizations like the Bank for International Settlements. They've set out a few principles. And one of the core principles, and this was articulated by the BIS and about six, I think, uh, central banks, uh, which are mainly from the advanced economies, including the US and UK. And one of the core principles that they have uh, sort of mentioned uh, that should be part of the design uh, for a, you know, a central bank digital currency is that it should coexist with existing forms of money. Um, so uh, that is something for us to keep in mind as well. And the last thing I would say is that it's not just for CBDCs, and I, 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 I think uh, perhaps Francis and Kamaljit will say more on this, but uh, this preference for cash, financial inclusion, it, it's not just about technological advancements, right? There are other factors as well, and one of them being your behavioral preferences uh, of the consumer. So I think that is something that's going to uh, come up, not just in case of CBDCs, but other fintech, you know, uh, uh, developments as well. Um, I'll stop there and, you know, allow my fellow. Before we get front to back in, before we get front yeah. back in, one last question. I'm not going to let you go yet. I just, sure. Do you have a view on the privacy and anonymity angle? Because many of us law abiding citizens, you know, we're happy to declare our taxes and so on, but we don't necessarily want everyone to know what we're doing real time. And how does, from a policy perspective, how do you think about that? Because again, you know, I'm happy to declare my taxes. I work for a regulated bank, uh, but do I want the government to know every single transaction real time with the ability to turn it off? That's another, uh, that's another important point and uh, a trade off, uh, you know, that you're talking about because cash is absolutely anonymous, right? Uh, mm. But there are other uh, issues when it comes to cash. You can't, you know, the ease yeah. with which you can transfer money online. Right? Around is hard. So you can't do it with cash, right? Uh, but that also lends itself to, um, you know, concerns from a policy perspective in terms of, you know, what, what about the financial integrity? Um, um, you know, are these transactions all right? Um, mm. So there is a trade-off that is involved there. Uh, to my mind, again, you know, once we move online, you're going to leave a digital trail. You know, it's, yeah. it's not going to be anonymous. So whether yes. it's through technology or a policy design, um, you know, there'll have to be a choice made in terms of how much will remain or continue to remain. Uh, what is the threshold for transactions mm -hmm. or amounts that will continue to remain anonymous? Uh, mm -hmm. And what will entail, you know, various financial entities that are going to be involved in this enterprise to, you know, perform the functions that they do today. Uh, when it comes to, you know, reporting mm -hmm. of uh, laundering, money laundering transactions or any other kind of fraud or any other suspicious activities. So that's a decision that will have to be taken. And in terms of design, what's also emerging is that you look at China's digital yuan and some other, um, you know, um, 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 research around what kind of designs can be crafted. I think what it seems to be uh, moving towards is this, you know, uh, which is to ascribe a certain threshold below which we will uh, we'll be okay with transactions not being tracked, but above that, um, you know, there will be the usual obligations in terms of tracking and uh, identifying, you know, suspicious transactions. Thank you, Great. Francis. I'm going to bring you back. Oh, come on, Jade, go on. Yeah, I just want to add to Priya's point on very limited rollouts of CBDC. Mm. Uh, yes, we are yet to see it in real life, uh, but. You know, cash is really a big problem, even in financial inclusion, because if you look at India as a market, typically, you know, it's uh, the, the direction of cash flow is in one way, right? So from tier one and tier two, the money transfer happens to the villages and in where cash is deposited in tier one, tier two, and cash is withdrawn in tier three and four, right? So it's a very big overhead to this whole business of financial inclusion of movement of this cash supply and cash deposit, right? So we are really hopeful that CBDC will really reduce or solve this issue where, you know, we can kind of digitize this whole uh, movement of cash and reduce the costs and the risks associated with cash. And definitely there's a trans transaction cost or a transfer cost that if we do it digitally, we don't, you know, we have much lower transaction costs Again, that goes back to the question I think Francis raised or point, you know, the system works so well right now. Um, maybe that's going to help us do inclusion anyway, but we'll come back to inclusion in a second. Francis, did you want to jump in on CBDCs? Anything yeah. to that? Yeah. So, so, you know, in fact, uh, why do we need CBDCs, right? I mean, we have, let's look at India today. 
Uh, we have the best system in place when it comes to financial infrastructure. Branches all across. Okay, uh, I remember way back when I was working on ATM managed services, there had to be like you know three thousand. Uh, what do you say, individuals in the village to have an ATM there? Okay, so today we're not even talking that. We're talking about a cell phone in every individual's hand who probably is above the age of 15, right? I mean, that's how you know all of the World Bank entities and IMF and all look at people who should be transacting by that age time. Okay, so here we talk about good infrastructure in India in terms of payments. Okay, and then we have you know another side of the population that says only three percent of the population is paying taxes in India. Okay, now what are we trying to solve, right? Okay, a chicken and egg situation. Individuals concerned about government seeing their transactions and the government having a different concern altogether. Mm. Okay, yeah. Everyone loves to be in a big brother position, right? Okay, but let's look what's privately important for the government. And I'm not being a devil's advocate here, trying to side on the other side. I'm just a payments professional, you know, working on both sides of the model. But if you look at the government, okay, it's got so many problems to solve, right? It's got tax issues. It has to, it has to ensure taxes are happening. It has to ensure that every individual is paying its taxes, okay, at least above poverty line, okay. And if you look at it, just three percent of them are paying, okay. Yeah. So, so is this a balanced equation? It is not, okay. How are we trying to solve it? Will putting CBD season, okay, in the system, in the, uh, you know, in the entire payments infrastructure, actually help out? Possibly, okay, because there's a lot of inherent features that CBDCs have, which today's real-time payments and the actual digital payments infrastructure doesn't have today. Okay, mm -hmm. so CBDCs actually move, carrying all of the transactions together with them. You could monitor them. You could actually apply real-time policies. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, Priya, but you'd be able to apply real-time policies and actually maneuvering the economy. Okay, you'd be able to stimulate spending or you'd be able to rein in inflation mm -hmm. or a lot of this in real time. You don't wait for a three-month you know, policy meeting to actually put in the policy, right? By which month, you know, three in those three months, thousands of you know, or probably trillions of crores have gone, you know, just wasted. So, so I, I look at CBDCs actually performing a lot more, you know, play in or rather than adding a lot more play to the current uh, uh, digital payments infrastructure uh, of not just India but even the even the world. You know, let me take a small statistics here, okay? And and this is something that I, that I read more recently than probably I read from uh, from UPI. So I'll refer to back to Saudi Arabia, where they, you know, they implemented uh, Sari as the instant payment system in uh, April 2021. So I was looking at the statistics for, excuse me, for for August 2022, and you won't believe it. Just the August 22, 2022, okay, the an entire volume of payments, okay, in in, in terms of dollars was 12.2 billion dollars just for the month of August, okay. 73% of those transactions were done after office hours and on the weekends. Okay, just imagine that. Okay, we're not talking during regular business hours. We're not even talking business transactions. After office hours and during weekends. Imagine this number in India. Okay, that's huge. Okay, imagine having this kind of volume being included, okay, which was never seen before. That's huge. And I think that's where it's important, you know, that if real time could achieve this much, Imagine what CBDC could achieve. Okay, if if real time payments could reach, you know, tier three, and you know, tomorrow as we segment more in terms of tier four cities and and plus, okay, we'd see a lot more transactions getting involved, you know, and included into the economy. And I think that's where CBDCs are going to have that kind of impact, uh, basically, you know, in adding to real time, in being able to uh, leverage more data from the transactions, in being able to allow the government to take more intelligent decisions than they are doing today. And, and I think that's what's more important for economy. A growing economy like India, okay, if you compare it to that of China, okay, uh, in terms of CBDC transactions, huge plus there, but there are going to be challenges, okay? So if you look at China today, the yuan, as much as we're hearing a lot about it, it, there are internal challenges in terms of adoption. There are big brother issues. People don't believe it entirely, okay? Uh, there's a huge uh, push being done by the government, even in terms of, you know, uh, discouraging you know, Alipay and VPay in order to ensure that EU on transactions grow on. The Winter Olympics was purely a, a EU on, uh, you know, a, a stadium. There were no other transactions happening there. So, so all of this basically to ensure that you're getting a lot more information from the public. But India isn't that way. That's not the way our democracy works. Okay. But yes, with CBDCs in place, I believe financial inclusion will be a much more stronger uh, opportunity for us. And just on that financial inclusion point that Francis has finished on, 
whether it's CBDCs or fintech in general, I don't know if um, Priya, you want to jump in or Kamaljit talk about again how how is this going to help us? You know, nearly everyone is banked now in India compared to 10, 15 years ago when there was a lot of underbanked. Uh, you know, people have very cheap smartphones now. Um, what's the yeah, what's like the kind of next step here in terms of financial inclusion? What do we still need to do? Uh, yeah, Ronit. Uh, first of all, uh, let me share some experience that we have of working with banks. Uh, so they are very key to work with fintechs, right? Almost every private sector bank or public sector bank <laughs> is working with fintechs, has created positions of alliance, chief digital officers, right? Uh, from, let's say, about 10 years ago, five years ago, where banks used to see fintechs as competition, now they are firmly of the belief that they have to cooperate with the fintechs, right, for their own benefit and for the whole benefit uh, of the ecosystem. One example is that, uh, you know, the fintech conferences that I used to go to earlier, there were hardly any speakers from banks or audience from bank, but today I'm, I'm here at the Geo World Center. I've already run into quite a few banker, banker friends here who are quite you know, speaking, plus attending, listening, learning, going to the booths and all. So they are very keen. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, obviously banks have to, to kind of really collaborate with fintechs. Uh, they are finding it difficult. They are putting in a lot of effort to change their model, right? Uh, whether it's a branch model, whether it's the core banking model, their technology model, uh, they are coming up with these API layer, open banking and all. Uh, where they can tie up with multiple fintechs uh, to collaborate. So they are putting in a lot of effort. They are of the firm belief uh, that for their future growth and to serve the lot of the huge segment uh, for, for new business generation, uh, they really have to uh, collaborate uh, with the banks. Now, coming on to the, the, the physical network, the branch uh, network, uh, see, fintech, typically when we, when we talk about fintech, the idea comes of a app, right? It's, it's going to be an app or a B2 or a, a website, right? Uh, but, you know, for the masses, right? The app or the smartphone, yes, they all have smartphones now, uh, but it's, it's good for YouTube and WhatsApp, right? So when we do a survey of our customers, we find that about 95% of our customers uh, use their smartphones for YouTube and WhatsApp. But when it comes to using for payments or for banking transactions, uh, they are not comfortable at all because they 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 feel that whom if there's a problem whom will they go to right uh, so so there's a huge segment of tech enabled people who still want to visit a branch for their physical uh, for for their for their uh, banking transactions so you know we are currently running about 250 such branches branches on behalf of banks right mm -hmm. so we are working with about five banks uh, where we have opened the branches in the ultra rural areas uh, the branches are really designed to be comfortable for the customer base, right? Uh, I mean, they have no air conditioning, they have no glass door, they are just a very basic shop, comfortable with fan, with CCTV, with all the technology there, uh, where our customer also feels comfortable and respectful in coming to those uh, branches. And they open for extended hours, uh, right? Uh, they are not like closing at, you know, four o'clock or something. So we believe that branches, right, though they may be multi-bank branches, one branch being able to serve, you know, all the financial needs of a customer, right, because of the economic viability is also a question when it, when you talk of uh, branches. Uh, so, so a branch which can provide services of multiple banks, multiple financial services, let's say insurance, mutual fund, loan application is already kind of proving uh, to be what is required, and I believe it will continue to be uh, growing. Uh, I also want to talk of agri lending. When you talk of collaboration between uh, banks and fintech, so agri lending has been a extremely high priority sector for the for the banks and the for the government. Uh, but lately, what we have seen is that banks, including the largest public sector bank of the country, has asked for partnership with fintechs and agri techs to actually source agri loans, right? So it's not just about filling a form, going to the branch. Uh, banks are wanting agri techs, which are having 
lot of these uh, the new technology like the drone survey, the satellite survey information, the land survey, the crop survey, weather survey, all that information and data to be used together with the fintech when they are giving a loan to the to the agri agri sector, right? So, so uh, I believe that uh, in the very near future, this will be one of the biggest areas where fintechs will will grow uh, into the agri lending sector in collaboration or serving the needs of the banks. Uh, can, I, can I just jump in and ask you to elaborate on two points? Um, when you talked about your clients, still, you know, they use their phone for WhatsApp and YouTube, but not from finance. Can you give us some stats or some color around what type of clients these are, like in terms of demographic, occupation, income level? I mean, are we talking about these are like very poor people in villages or slightly, you know, these farmers? Are they poor people in, you know, small towns? Can you just give us some more demographic? It's a, it's a really interesting point about we just assume everyone has a phone, so they must be banking online. But there's technology and then there's using it. So I'd love you to elaborate on that, please. Sure, sure. In tier one and two, it's basically the migrant workers, right? So they are earning 15,000, 20,000 rupees a, work, uh, a month. They are either gig economy workers or factory workers, auto rickshaw driver, small shop owner, right? Uh, so they have definitely have a smartphone. Uh, but when it comes to sending money home, they are actually coming to one of our branches and of our uh, peers and giving in cash and then asking that agent to transfer money to the bank account of their relative or their friend and the village so this is the tier uh, one and two in tier three and four again they are farmers they are factory workers right who are coming to these uh, branches so they have a smartphone but they're they're not using the uh the 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 the, 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 the digital capability completely Got it. I think Priya, you wanted to jump in there. Just a couple of quick points. Uh, one is that, you know, what you mentioned earlier about financial inclusion, um, the RBI's financial inclusion index, I think we are clocking about 50, 65 yeah. out of 100 points. So we still have some way to go. So we're not all there yet when it comes to financial inclusion. There are still unserved and underserved segments in the society. And uh, the other thing that, that I wanted to quickly respond to is what uh, Francis was saying earlier in terms of where he saw the use cases for CBDCs. I think you were talking about um, fiscal uh, benefit transfers, right? Uh, so I'm just going to come from an academic point of view and maybe highlight also the kind of um, complexities that are involved in rolling out a central bank digital currency. So if the today um, the central bank doesn't take decisions when it comes to credit, those are taken by the commercial banks, right? That's at the second layer, and there's a reason for that. You, you need the central banks are supposed to be independent and that is what sort of uh, helps to create and conserve that trust we have in the system because they're at the they're the fulcrum of the two-tier financial architecture that we have today uh, and i think that sort of um, applies to um you know use cases like use cases for cbdc's like direct benefit transfer fiscal transfers as well because then uh, are we blurring the lines between central bank which ought to be independent and you know maybe other sort of uh, entities um, that may have others, other motivations to, uh, you know, pursue that. So I think we, uh, so each of these use cases or motivations or benefits that we perceive that CBDCs will have also have, um, you know, certain risks or concerns or implications that we need to very carefully consider. Um, and um, that, that, that's just to sort of say that, um, you know, um, it'll depend as we go down this path, it'll depend on how we sort of manage those trade-offs and take those policy decisions and design um, the digital currency. And the third point, I just quickly wanted to say your question, Ronit, was, you know, what's the what's the value proposition for a digital rupee in India? Uh, but that's one part of the, you know, sort of overall picture. There is a, certainly a use case or a value proposition for CBDCs in the wholesale and the cross-border context, which is, you know, yeah. riddled with um, a lot of transaction costs, right? So, and there are a lot of experiments, multi-CBDC uh, experiments that are already happening. Um, uh, on blockchain or otherwise, and I think uh, some of them have also in their um, uh, proof of concept stage indicated that they have the potential to drastically reduce these transaction costs. So we haven't heard, uh, this is just the beginning, we haven't heard the last yet, and we're likely to see that there will be definitely some traction, uh, at least on the cross-border side. And, mm -hmm. and to my mind on the domestic side, I think uh, the more the merrier, and central bank money, as I said, just has um, you know, uh, greater weightage when it comes to private money. 
I'll just stop there. Yeah, no, absolutely. On the cross border side, uh, effectively, you're giving because it's digital and it's trackable from a policy perspective and even a regular user perspective, you're giving a more 21st century version of like almost the Hawala network that's operated around the Arabian Sea. Uh, Francis and I both worked in the Middle East and money moves almost instantaneously. It's just not very trackable and legal, whereas this allows us as a policy from a policy perspective or the official financial sector that we're part of, this is a much better solution. Now, I'm conscious of the time. We have like seven or eight minutes left before we wrap up. And I don't know if we wanted to explore a little bit further two points. One is the point that I thought was really interesting that Kamajit was making about the combination of physical and digital. And I think many of us, in fact, I'm assuming the whole panel here rarely goes into a bank for personal reasons. We, I'm guessing, are very, at least I am digital. I really don't like going into a branch once a year for KYC reasons or something. You have to go and you end up spending an hour or more signing documents that really should be done digitally these days. Um, this point on physical and digital is interesting for me because I've looked at other markets, um, maybe even less developed, uh, in some cases a lot less developed than India when it comes to infrastructure. I'm thinking particularly in Africa, um, people talk about their fancy apps and their this and that. Nigeria, for example, has real-time payments um, and has had it for much longer than the US. Uh, or the UAE, but in Nigeria, people still, the agent banking network is huge. People like to, whether it's uh, a kiosk in the big city or in the small town, the village, the same that we saw with the growth of M-Pesa in Kenya, there's, it, there's this real need for the physical. And are we at risk of just forgetting the kind of, that we need to have a combination of physical and digital? Maybe it's not a, maybe it's not a relevant question, but I, again, thinking of it from the point of view, not us as, you know, financial professionals or fintech people or policy people, but as get the you know the famous common man and woman, don't we want to have a bit more stress on the physical as well? Uh, I'll I'll uh, take this here. Okay, so uh, you know if we look at Africa and we look at India, right? I mean, uh, we've been hearing about financial inclusion in Africa way back. You know, since the middle of the uh, early 2000s, right? I mean, like 2005, 2006, you had M-Pesa and all of them, you had short codes that were used to make payments. Okay, and, and that was a huge thing that was happening there that was re revolutionary. And, you know, at that point of time, I was in Saudi Arabia and I wasn't seeing the same thing on the side, you see? So just across the waters, the Red Sea, and you didn't see it happening here, but it was happening over there. And at the same time, okay, because we had African ATM distributors and they were selling ATMs. So cash was also important. And it's the same thing, you know, if you look at, let's say an economy like India, okay, which is a cash rich economy, even today, as you mentioned earlier, as much as we have digital, as we have digital payments growing, we also have cash growing, right? And, and that's purely because the economy is growing. The, 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 the point that actually we also miss is, are we actually digitally ready enough you know, as users to make use of digital payments, okay? So as Kamaljit raised, raised the point, right? You've got gig workers who have a smartphone, who are very smart on it in terms of using all the applications and they still enter his branch to make a payment, to make a transfer. And I think I think that's that's what, you know, we are lacking yet, you know, and, and when I say we am, I'm talking in general of, you know, uh, economies like uh, India and India itself, okay? Is I, I think uh, education is important. Okay, being able to spread the message is important. Okay, and also being able to decide how much of your economy as a country do you want as being physical and digital, and that's very important, right? Okay, I mean, you don't want cash to disappear. You just don't want cash to disappear. Okay, you don't want it all to be digital. You want to still have, you know, a physical aspect of it that 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 actually emphasizes your sovereignty. Okay, as a central bank. Okay, as a country, and and that's very important, basically. Okay, so you 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 heard about you know Sweden where where cash is diminishing. It's at the range of about two percent. Okay, and and the central bank is already frantic. You know how can it, can I actually have more cash mm. come back into the economy in terms of physical cash? Mm. So there's a need for physical. There's a need need for digital. And and I I think we are still at a very early stage, you know, of being able to make that definition. Mm. Okay, but but probably ten years down the line, a decade down the line, you know where We'd have a lot more uh, infrastructure in place, you know, where, as Kamaljit said, you know, alliances between fintech and and uh, banks, 
Okay, I would actually take it a step further and I would say mergers between fintech and banks to actually make them more fintech comp compatible. Okay, the banks of today, okay, getting into that kind of a mode because as digital payments grow, you would actually end up seeing, and, and this is a challenge to the banks, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, you would actually end up seeing banks getting minimized in their role with fintechs taking a bigger bigger role. And, and that's where, you know, you would actually see that kind of mergers taking place. And probably the, they would retain a physical and a digital aspect of payments. Uh, I, I would I would hold out. That's it. Thank you. I think we're getting a cue to start slowly yeah. picking up. <laughs> and we have three minutes left, I think. And maybe we can do Web3 in three minutes. Does anyone want to try Web3 in three minutes? <laughs> so obviously the challenge of Web3 is like, you know, what does it mean? How do we define it? Um, I think Priya at the start gave us a really good kind of definition by talking about centralized versus decentralized. What's the kind of, and maybe you get a minute each, like what's Web3 in India going to look like? Uh, are we ready for this? Is this still a kind of media consulting chat? I, I can go first. Uh, I have to admit that I don't know a lot about it as yet. Uh, it's a fascinating area and I'm still learning, but uh, I think we're still some time away. Uh, but what uh, what is really interesting is that even as you see, you know, um, you know, I, I'm told that we are in the midst of a third crypto winter, uh, and the narrative in India has largely been around exchanges and cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. But there is this underlying, you know, uh, a lot of work that's happening when it comes to blockchain and Web3 applications uh, in our startup ecosystem. A lot of investments that have been coming in. Uh, so uh, it's an area to watch. Uh, as I said, I think we're still some time away. But you know, the, the, the promise is fantastic, of course, that we all have the ability to be on the net and have control over whatever we do and the data that we have. So it's, it's a great promise. Um, yeah. One to watch. Kamaljit, France, to watch, any yeah. last words on Web3? Um, yeah, I'll just uh, touch upon the metaverse side of Web 3.0. Yeah. Uh, so I think the, the, the customer engagement piece here, right? So, because, you know, currently, if you look at the apps, they're very dry, they're very yeah. technical, they're very financial. Yeah. Uh, so, to add that fun element, that yeah. engagement element, uh, I think that is where uh, Web 3.0 will contribute to the whole financial industry. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And if I can make a plug, I sorry, this is shameless, but we wrote a big report at City, which, which I led earlier this year, called Metaverse and Money. So, you can Google that. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Francis, you got the last word. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I just like to, and again, I'm not that well read when it comes to that free, but the little that I've been doing together with the CBDCs. And I do see certain challenges, right? So, yeah, you have more control on your data. Okay. You 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 allow yourself to be an avatar within the Web3 space or the metaverse space. Okay. But what stops if you're having three or four different avatars, right? Oh, we're going to okay, have so loads. You're going to have 10 you're avatars. Have loads, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. all of those avatars making payments on your behalf, right? With different Absolutely. names, and, different yeah. and, you and an avatar could be a male, and another could be a female, and the third yeah, could be and catfishing. And if one yeah. avatar behaves badly, what exactly. does that mean? Yeah. So, so there are going to be challenges in terms of identifying individuals. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that boils down, or rather, you know, simply kind of filters down to: Will our centralized KYC system be strong enough mm -hmm. to be able to actually identify, collate? You know, and put together Web three transactions for a single individual who has multiple avatars, right? Yeah. Okay. So, how do you do a KYC for an avatar? Okay. Yeah. And how do you do it? Okay. So, I'm KYC, but if I have ten different avatars, how am I going to actually identify? And, and it's not me, right? I know all ten, ten of them. How is the government? How is the commercial sure. banks going to identify those avatars who are yeah. making payments on my behalf? You see. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, I think those those are certain challenges that the industry will have to look at. You you be know, in control because uh, ultimately you're the underlying, right? So exactly. instead of like 1.4 billion Indians, there's going to be 14 billion like Indians running around. So like, you know, I think on that note, we should probably draw the panel to a close. We hit the top of the hour, at least in Dubai, 12.30 in India. Uh, back, to, uh, back to our hosts. Thank you so much for joining us today. Wow, this was such an engaging session. I truly uh, like got enlightened with different aspects and different actually practical points of the same. Thank you speakers for joining us uh, for this session and sharing your expertise topped up with practical experiences along with statistics. Would also like to thank uh, Mr. Ronit Ghosh for moderating this session so well. So dear attendees, so we, with this, we'd like to bring this session to the end. 
And once again, I would like to thank uh, our speaker and moderator for being a part of this one and making it so interesting and engaging. It was an honor to have you all at Global Fintech Fest 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. And with this, we would like to thank uh, our sponsors and our partners. Team partner, WhatsApp, co-powered by Amazon Pay. Spend management partner in cash in association with Perfios. Payments partner, cash freeze payments. CEO's dinner partner, HSBC. Platinum partner, Google Pay. Phone Pay. Visa. M2P Fintech, Mastercard, Falcon, Registration Partner, NTT Data Payment Services. Thank you once again for joining us for this session. See you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.